Hello everyone, welcome to today's live broadcast, Immunoassays and Pain Management Drug Testing. I'm Robert Castellanos of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the C button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of attaining your credits. I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Margiana. Dr. Margiana is a director at Siemens Health Inners. He received his PhD in biochemistry from Queens University, working on the structure, mechanism, and drug interaction of aldocatoreductases. He led projects and development and commercialization of drugs of abuse, pain management, and immunosuppressant immunoassays. Dr. Marciano has 24 years of experience in the diagnostic industry. His current work focus includes immunoassays and application development on the multiple instruments. He is a member of the ASBMB SOFT and AACC and has published peer-reviewed papers and abstracts and inventor on patents. He is on the editorial board of Biotechnology and Applied Biochemistry and served as an editorial board of the Internet Journal Genomics and Progenomics. I'll now turn it over to the doctor for his presentation. Pain management drug testing. Uh, to go through the, uh, the goal of my presentation is to enhance knowledge of immunoassay used in detection of drugs uh, and to better understand immunoassays features and testing results. What is immunoassays? Immunoassay is refer to techniques that use or utilize antibody to react with a specific drugs or antigen in order to measure it, their, their concentrations. The antibodies could be directed toward a, a specific drug or class of drug. In order to measure the drugs, a drug label marker used for, to monitor the reaction. The marker can be an enzyme, fluorophore, particles, depending on the technology. Most of the drug detection tests are homogeneous immuno enzyme immunoassay. Enzymes are the ideal uh, molecule uh, for enzyme immunoassays because they can amplify the signal of the reaction. Activity of the enzyme labeled drug can be modulated or changed when binding to the antibodies. Automated drug tests, which I'm going to concentrate on right in this presentation, most of those automated are immunoassays. Uh, there are different technology used for drug testing, including emit technologies, CEDIA, FPIA, and KIMS. Immunoassay technique use both monoclonal, monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies. And those assays mainly used for initial screening of drugs. But especially in urine drug testing, and also my con I'm, I'm concentrating on this in this presentation. Automated drug testing also could be used for in the treatment plan for patients on prescribed drugs. Other technique, immunoassay technique used, such as ELISA and point of care, all immunoassay-based technique. Enzyme homogeneous immunoassays are competitive assays, very successful to, to monitor, to use with a small molecule. 
it can detect up to n nanomolar levels of drugs and could be applied on multiple system or multiple analyzers. They are, they are based on, a three, on pr three principles. One is the ability of mo or, or modulation of the enzyme by analyte and modulation of the enzyme activity or enzyme conjugate activity by binding to the antibody and also enzyme catalysis of the reactions. So uh, enzyme act as signal amplifier for antibody antigen interaction. And lastly is the interaction between drug and antibody is important to initiate the assay or the reaction. Now, if we have um, a drug present in the sample, what would happen? The, most of the antibody in a, in a reaction will bind to a drug, a drug or a free drug in the sample. Less antibody will bind to uh, the enzyme drug conjugate, leaving us with a large, large concentration of uh, enzyme conjugate or drug enzyme uh, labeled enzyme that causing would lead to higher activity and reflected in the high concentration of a drug. If we have low concentration or no concentration of drugs present in the sample, less drug would bind to the antibody, more enzyme labeled drug will bind to antibody, causing inhibition or lowering activity of the conjugate or the enzyme conjugate, and therefore reflecting the level of concentration of the drug. How the reaction proceed? Uh, sample, the drug, drug in the sample added, or the sample added to the incubated with the antibody, including the enzyme substrates. Then with short incubation, the enzyme conjugate or enzyme labeled drug will be added, competing with the free drugs to the antibody binding sites. The bound antibodies will get inhibited, but the bound, in, uh, bound antibodies causing inhibition of this enzyme conjugate and the free conjugate in the reaction mixture stays active, causing conversion of the substrate, in this case, uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme and the substrate is glucose 6-phosphate uh, coenzyme NAD producing a product and NADH which can be monitored at 340 nanometer. What consider consideration we need to be, or uh, consideration for selection of antibody to test for drug or to develop assays for drug? First, if you're selecting polyclonal antibody, polyclonal antibody, we have to maintain lot lot consistency as and minimize the variability between different bleeds or different pools. Secondly, maintain supply of the antibody, basically keeping the animal alive in order to take a bleed from them. Thirdly, is consistent supply of immunogen so we can immunize more animals. Monoclonal antibody is very consistent between lots and consistency in, in also in specificity can be produced in many different animals. The third part in consideration is detection. What do we want to detect? Do we want to detect entire class of drugs, such as benzodiazepine, a single drug, and metabolite, or parent drug, metabolite, and related drugs such as ecstasy and opiates, uh, or drugs enantiomers, such as amphetamine, the D and L amphetamine uh, group, or think very specific drugs such as 6-acetylmorphine that require a specific antibody or meta testing metabolites or detection of metabolites such as the cocaine metabolite in this case. 
antibody specificity and cross-reactivity. What antibody specificity is, it's really the ability of the individual antibody to, uh, to react with uh, a specific drugs or the ability of population of antibody to react with only one drug. So more specific to certain drug, and it has the ability to distinguish between a targeted drug and related, structurally related drugs. And this case, you see on the top here, uh, uh, the kind of uh, the, the specificity. Cross-reactivity is the opposite where the antibody, ability of the antibodies to react with multiple drugs, more than one antigenic determinant, or more, one, more than one drug, or ability of population of antibody to react with more than one drug. And this interaction could be through, uh, through sharing the epitopic site of the target analyte, or have the epitopic site for the cross-reactant is similar to that of the targeted drug. Immunoassay cross-reactivity testing. When you test for immunoassays, uh, for drugs that give you two types of results, uh, you know, cross-reactivity testing can give you, could, you could do testing through different, two different ways. One is identifying the drug, the concentration of drugs that give you an equivalent response to their cutoff. The secondly is calculating or determining the percent cross-reactivity of a drug. Determining percent cross-reactivity of a drug is usually misleading. More appropriate for customer or people who test by using immunoassay to understand the what concentration of a cross-reactant that give you positive result or give you a result that is equivalent to the cutoff. What kind of cross-reactant we encounter when we develop assays. One is desirable, those are desirable drug, structurally related drugs and metabolites. So they are structurally related to the, uh, the targeted drug and you want to detect them, preferably to detect them, such as oxymorphone detection with oxycodone assay. Insufficient detection of these drugs will lead to false positive, uh, false negative results. The second group of cross reactants are undesirable structurally related drugs, that is, drugs that are structurally related to the target analyte, but we don't want them to be detected by the assay. In this case, uh, with amphetamine assay, detection of ephedrine or pseudoephedrines, which are structurally related to amphetamine, can cause false positive results. The third group is undesirable structurally unrelated drugs. And the, an example for that, the cross-reactivity of a trazodone, which is struck with an ecstasy assay. This kind of cross-reactivity is very challenging in, and problematic in, in immunoassay testing. So what kind of drug antibody we can use in immunoassays? One example I put here on the left is using two monoclonal antibody to, uh, to have a, a, an amphetamine assay that picks up amphetamine and methamphetamine. And as you see here, the standard curves are very superimposable. The second part you can use uh, a polyclonal antibody to detect a drug, a related drug, and metabolite, in this case, an example is ecstasy. In polyclonal antibody, will pick up MDMA, MDEA, and MDA. The third, on the right, is a specific assay which is used monoclonal antibody to detect a single drug. In this case, 6-acetyl morphine. Immunoassay testing protocol. Immunoassays give you two types of results. Testing one qualitative testing, which provide you with the sample testing as positive or negative versus a predetermined cutoff. 
or threshold. Uh, testing, this testing is very useful in detecting for initial drug testing uh, for or initial drug screening for detecting the presence of absence of drug versus the cutoff level. Reporting positive and negative results of a sample does not reflect the concentration of this sample versus a cutoff. The second part of testing was called semi-quantitative because it provides approximate concentration of a drug, metabolite, or a class of drugs. And this is concentrated determined even in nanograms per mil or micrograms per mil. Testing, this kind of testing is very useful in drug monitoring and assessing patient samples. Also useful for determining if you wanted to further investigate sample and you want to know the concentration of this sample for confirmation purpose or other purposes, semi-quantitative testing would be very useful. Immunoassay cutoffs. Immunoassays for drugs, I see on the left, on the right here, uh, a list of immunoassays available in the market. The first seven are the worker-based test, testing, uh, testing for worker-based testing drugs. And those are, they have offered urine drug testing for those assays offer at least one cutoff, some of them two, some of them three cutoffs. The one in bold are the cutoff, the mandated cutoff, or SAMSHA mandated cutoff for workplace drug testing. Amphetamine, for example, has three cutoffs available in the market, 300, 500, 1,000, the 500 is the mandated cutoff. Oxycodone, hydrocodone, there are proposed guidelines for testing those drugs at the level of 100 and 300 respectively, but has, have not been implemented yet. The rest of the drug, other drugs also available in two or three, two, two, one or two cutoff. Pibinorphine, five and 10 nanograms per mil, example. Tramadol, 200 nanograms per mil. Provexafine, 300 nanograms per mil. Are these assay use in urine drug testing, but also there are proposed guidelines by SAMHSA for other, other matrices such as oral, oral fluid. In drug testing, it is important to understand the separation between the cutoff and controls, or a cutoff and positive sample and negative sample. Federally mandated tests required to test control was at plus minus 25% of the cutoff and can be used for pain management testing. Now, if you're running cutoff and controls on multiple replicates, the, it's ideally that the overlap between the lowest and the highest result of any negative or positive control uh, uh, and the cutoff the overlap would be a zero. However, if the high results of a negative sample or negative control overlap with the cutoff, causing, as you see here, the negative sample to give you false positive results. Or if the lowest, con con low lowest number or data from the controlled overlap with the cutoff causing false negative results of the sample. And as you see here on, on, the, on the left, an overlap, statistical overlap between the cutoff and control for 6AM assay, the overlap is zero. That means none of those in equal 20 tested for each level overlap with the cutoff. Um, immunoassay detection capability. 
expressed in two, in two ways is really the smallest concentration that can be detected or quantitated through the calculation of limit of detection and limit of quantitation. Limit of detection is useful to discriminate the presence or absence of a drug in the sample. Limit quanti of quantitation, LRQ, very used, could be used reliably or useful for rel reliable measurement of the drugs in samples. Now, how important is the limit of detection for drug screening? The fact that most of the limit of quantitation or detection are much lower than the cutoff level. So there are limited usage or benefit of using limit of detection in initial screening. However, if you, if you want to detect the drugs of interest, uh, in a clinical sample, if you want, or you want to detect the absence of drug in the clinical sample, the limit of quantitation is maybe useful. Opioids are the most prescribed drugs for pain management. Opioids and opiates are, are the, the term is used interchangeably between the two. However, the opiates are the ones that are natural alkaloids derived from poppy poppy resin, resin, such as morphine, codeine. The semi-synthetic opioids and synthetic opioids are the semi-synthetic opiates are driven from the natural opioids. However, Fully synthetic opiates such as methadone, proboxyphene, fentanyl, also used for pain management. Opiate assays. Opiate assays usually used for detection of morphine and codeine, but also, and many assays in the market use either polyclonal antibody or monoclonal antibody. However, opioid assays, opiate assays picks up or detect hydrocodone, hydromorphone, other opioids, and also detect 6-acetylmorphine and that hydrocodone, and some, to some extent, buprenorphine. However, none of the opiate assays detect, well, oxycodone and oxymorphone. Therefore, those two drugs require a separate assay for their detection. The cutoff offered for opiate, there are the low cutoff of the 300 nanograms per mil, the mandated cutoff 2,000 nanograms per mil. 300 cutoff, cutoff is more sensitive for pain management and uh, drug testing monitoring. And the structure on this the structure unrelated cross drug cross-reactivity with some of those opiates uh, assays are quite common, and this is an example here for structurally unrelated drug interfere with opiate assay. So opiate assay here in this table, a comparison between the cross-reactivity of four opiate assays at a 300 nanograms per mil cutoff. As, as you see, all the assays pick up or detect codeine and morphine very well. However, detection of oxycodone and ox oxymorphone, oxycodone and oxymorphone are not very well, uh, you know, reliable, and uh, and require high high concentration of those drugs to be present in order for the assay to pick them up. However. Hydrocodone and hydromorphone detected at a concentration with some assays, which is very close to the the 300 cutoff. The same for 6-acetyl morphine and morphine 3-glucuronide. Naloxone is not detected, which is very good, positive with a number of those assays at at very high concentration. Now, a positive sample of for from an opiate assay doesn't prove that the sample would have 
uh, morphine and codeine present in it. Uh, we found out one of the samples we tested recently, uh, was, which was positive at 2,000 nanograms a mil, does not have codeine and morphine, rather it has high concentration of oxy, total oxycodone, about 57,000 nanograms a mil. In order to understand the opiate uh, the result or interpret the result, you need to understand the opiate metabolism and opiate acid you're using. Those acids have different cross-reactivity profile. And as you see here, opiate metabolism, see morphine coming mainly from poppy seed uh, uh, ingestion, but also morphine is a metabolized, we get a morphine coming from 6-acyl morphine, which we metabolized of heroin. Codeine get metabolized to morphine, codeine to hydro, mor codone, morphine to hydromorphone. So in order to understand the, uh, the result, you understand the relative concentration of those drugs in the sample. SAMHSA and pain management. And this is concerning oxycodone and oxymorphone. Recently, last year actually, um, uh, SAMHSA proposed or published a proposed guideline for required testing for oxycodone and oxymorphone and hydrocodone hydromorphone as, as part of the initial federal work, workplace screening or testing. The cutoff of proposed are 100 nanograms per mil for oxycodone, 300 nanograms per mil for hydrocodone, allowing to confirm those drugs at lower level, as you see here for oxycodone, 50 oxycodone, 50 hydrocodone, for um, hydromo hydromorphone, 50 for hydromorphone, hydrocodone, 50, 100 hydrocodone, and 100 hydromorphone. And also, Oxycodone assay should recover, should have cross-reactivity with oxymorphone at the level of 80% or above. The same for hydrocodone assay must have, must cross-react with hydromorphone at level of 80% or above. Oxycodone, as this data was published by Kuhn and his group, on metabolism of or excretion of hydrocodone, oxycodone in urine sample after a dose of 20 nanograms, 20 milligrams uh, oxycodone in 12 subjects. And as you see here in this diagram, oxy, the oxy, oxy, noroxic morphone and oxycodone appears the highest within the first 10 hours, followed by oxymorphone and neuroxymorphone. After 10 hours, they, they stay above the cutoff level, which is 50, nan 50 nanograms per mil for a, a duration of uh, at least 30, 30 hours. So the metabolism of oxycodone, oxycodone can meta metabolize to the neuroxycodone, to oxymorphone, and neuroxymorphone. Oxymorphone is an active, metab an active metabolite, however, neuroxymorphone and neuroxycodone uh, are relatively inactive. Oxycodone assays in the market offered, as I mentioned, with 300 and 100 cutoff, cross reactivity to oxymorphone, oxymorphone should be equal to greater than 80%, and most of the assays, they meet that. Oxycodone assays have minimum cross reactivity to codeine and morphine, as published in the package insert of those assays. The 100 cutoff and may be suitable for screening and monitoring, monitoring oxycodone and oxymorphone. And as you see here, a table 
show the cross reactivity of a number of opioids at 100 oxycodone 100 nanograms per mil level. What we see that uh, the, all the acids have good cross reactivity or higher number uh, for um, for codeine and morphine, which is good, and uh, the same for 6-acetyl morphine, uh, hydrocodone, and hydromorphone. However, some of the assay have do cross-react with naloxone um, at low uh, microgram level. Hydrocodone is also a, a semi-synthetic uh, opioid. Its metabolism was studied by Cohn and others and published in the GAT Journal of Toxicology. And the study was done after uh, following a single uh, 20 milligram dose over for, uh, for 30 hours for greater than 30 hours using 12 subjects. And as you see here, within the first 10 hours, uh, the hydrocodine and hydromorphone are the highest uh, metabolite, um, followed by the uh, hydromorphone and um, the hydrocodine. So the level of those drugs or metabol and metabolites stays above the cutoff level used, which is 100 nanograms of mil for over 30, um, 30 hours. So hydrocodone is metabolized into norhydrocodone and hydromorphone and dihydrocodone. Now, hydromorphone is an active metabolite, however, nor norhydrocodone is less active uh, metabolite uh, for hydrocodone. Hydrocodone assays uh, offered with 100 and 300 cutoff. Cross reactivity at 100 cutoff level is greater than 80% for hydromorphone. However, uh, cross reactivity of those assay available to oxycodone, oxymorphone, and for codeine and morphine uh, uh, is not that, that great. So, uh, for example, a, a codeine cross react was one of the assay at 3,000 um, uh, and morphine at uh, 5,000 nanograms a mil at a 100 cutoff. So there's a possibility, the fact that they have some cross reactivity to codeine, morphine, oxycodone, and mor oxymorphone, there's a possibility that we get false positive result or false negative result depend on, on, on the uh, metabolism. Buprenorphine assay available in the market as well, which two cut off 500, 5 nanograms per mil and 10 nanograms per mil as described in the package insert of uh, uh, all those assays, uh, they have low cross reactivity to naloxone and also to um, codeine morphine. However, um, some of the assays, uh, some of report or literature reported some cross reactivity of epinorphine assay, uh, epinorphine assay with uh, codeine with, code, with morphine and uh, other opioids. None of the assays uh, detect buprenorphine, norbuprenorphine, and their metabolites, glucuronide. The assay available picks up one metabolite, one parent compound and metabolite. Example, emit assay picks up code, uh, buprenorphine and norbuprenorphine equivalently. Uh, CD assay picks up also, uh, it picks up uh, uh, pubinorphine and norbuprenorphine glucuronide. The other two assays 
uh, picks up uh, the same uh, buprenorphine and norbuprenorphine. Fentanyl is one of the uh, 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 high potency high, uh, drugs. Uh, most of the cutoff available market as at two nanograms per mil uh, cutoff. They have minimum cross reactivity at least for one assay, minimum cross reactivity to codeine, morphine, and hydrocodone. And uh, low, both assays available here uh, have low cross reactivity to, toward uh, norfentanyl. So the possibility, the lack of cross reactivity to a major metabolite causing, may cause false false negative result with these assays. Benzodiazepine, also prescribed, although prescribed for an anxiety, insomnia, and seizure, so on, but also given as, as for, for pain. Metabolism of those compounds are very complex, uh, complicated. At least five assays, assays uh, available for the market using polytonal antibodies. All the assay use different calibrators or different things there that are being compiled in the calibrators, nitrazepam, oxazepam, diazepam. Cutoff available are 200 and 300 cutoff, and both of them could be used for pain management testing. Uh, the uh, for with this these things, there has been assay always false positive results could come from the lack first, the lack of cross reactivity with all other all the things there has been. Secondly, is with the structurally unrelated drugs might cause false positive results as well. Uh, so the primary challenge with things there has been assays is the lack of cross reactivity or detection of metabolites such as benzodiazepine gluconite, benzodiazepine gluconite, the 7-amino and alpha-hydroxy uh, metabolites. And as you see here, uh, those are metabolism, uh, metabolites from parent compounds. Some of manufacturer included a gluconidase pretreatment step, either on board or manual to detect gluconides. So by using lower cutoff, including gluconidase pre-step, you would increase the sensitivity of this assay and specificity of those assay for, uh, for testing. Amphetamines uh, um, uh, available in uh, three cutoff levels in the, uh, the assay either use monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies, and they have equal detection of D-amphetamine and D-methamphetamine at the cutoff level. Some assays also mix up the ecstasy drugs, MDMA, MDEA, and MDA. The three cutoff, 300 cutoff is a more sensitive cutoff if your assay is very specific, specific and uh, so you will be able to uh, use this low cutoff for pain management testing, um, and you have to take in consideration basically the cross reactivity profile of the of the of the, of the assay. Uh, structurally related drugs is a major problem with this assay, such as ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, and so on. Uh, and also cross the activity with structurally and related drugs such as trazodone, uh, libitolol, uh, tolmatine is imposing a, 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 a problem and causing false positive results. Why uh, cross the activity of amphetamines is a key because is a key challenge for these assays because the structural similarity between the Structurally desirable drug and undesirable drug. The drugs you want to detect and the one the one you don't want to detect, but they are structurally related drugs to your target drug. Amphetamine share 
uh, amphetamine share common structure that include phenyl ring, carbon side chain, and amino, amino group. And as you see here in the picture, that this, the structure of amphetamine, methamphetamine, ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, uh, and so on, are, are quite similar and have the same structural elements. So those drugs are likely to cross-react with amphetamine, amphetamine assay if your, if your antibody is not very specific. Other drugs available in the market uh, for pain, pain testing, mepiridine at 200 nanograms per mil cutoff. It's only one acid currently in the market. Uh, it has lower currency to to uh, other opioids. And the drug is metabolized to normal mepiridine. And it's important that you, the assay would have cross activity to this metabolite in order to avoid false negative results. Tramadol, uh, it's prescribed widely and uh, metabolized into a major metabolite, the N and O dismissal tramadol. The cutoff is available is 200 nanograms per mil and um, uh, uh, widely uh, um, used in detection of uh, tramadol and its metabolites. Methadone, the two cutoff available are 150 and 300. Most of the methadone assays have poor cross reactivity to the EDDB, a major metabolite, causing false positive, false negative results. So it's important to combine testing of methadone with testing of EDDB uh, specific assay. Um, a drug, urine drug testing screen, screen results. Result could be, uh, result of urine drug testing could be true positive. Sample could be true po negative results. That means uh, the drug is absent or in the sample or ingested, not ingested by the patient or drug degraded in the sample or not collected within the collection window. If you, the true positive samples which indicate where the drug is present in the sample and require confirmation. Um, also, um, the drug, the assay is very specific and picking up only uh, the a drug but not other compounds. False positive results, if you get it, it means other prescription and non-prescriptive drugs are present and picked up. And this is required basically uh, that applies for many of the class assays, just as, such as amphetamine, as there has been opiate and required confirmation. False negative results are when a drug is or metabolite is present but not detected by the assay and requires then alternative method for detection, for confirmation. Confirmation testing, have only one slide on it, LCMS and DCMS being used, and those techniques are uh, those analytic te techniques uh, uh, identify individual drugs in, po in, in, in positive sample uh, or any sample of interest. Uh, confirmation cutoffs, uh, usually there are for drug, uh, for work, work place, place drug testing, there, is, uh, there are confirmation cutoff levels, which are lower than the cutoff levels uh, proposed by, by SAMHSA, except, except we have 6 acetyl morphine and BCB. The cutoff and the confirmation concentration are the same. Confirmation um, of a class of assay is a challenging, for, and it need, need to be understood in the scope of the test. Uh, confirmation is not done on, it's done on drug of interest as well when you have sometimes negative results to me, in order to detect patient, if patient taking a drugs uh, uh, or in clinical interpretation of any results. In compliance, 
immuno assay and compliance monitoring. Immuno assay are useful in patient overall compliance, uh, useful in determining the source of a group, a group of drugs or a new drug, uh, uh, provide uh, information on non-compliance and non-adherence as well. Uh, uh, cut off, low cutoff of those man, number of assays may be useful, uh, useful tool for monitoring compliance uh, for drug. So finally, in our conclusion in this presentation, I would like to say we covered the amino assay as are available are available to test pain management drugs, especially on the low cutoff level assays. Uh, specificity varies from amino acids between amino acids used. Understanding the amino acid characteristic, their cross reactivity, and uh, features are important in, in, in interpretation of the results. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We're going to try to answer as many questions as time allows. Doctor, our first question is, what is the ideal analytical method for drugs? And the ideal analytical method has been used, uh, widely used GCMS, but recently LCMS becoming more the uh, LCMS is uh, becoming uh, the, the method of choice because its sensitivity and ability of detect uh, to, sense, to lower levels detect drugs in the samples. Thank you. Do you think LCMS and SSA will eventually replace IA? Will it replace, uh, can you repeat your question please? Oh, not a problem. Do you think LCMS-MS assay will eventually replace IA? Uh, um, I don't. I don't think so. The reason for that is um, uh, amino assays are, are um, especially automated amino assay used to screen thousands of samples. It's, uh, 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 very fast, efficient uh, way of screening sample. Although there are po potential of uh, sometimes uh, positive or negative results that you need to be confirmed. Uh, however, if you want to um, uh, test everything using uh, using LCMS, that would be very costly and uh, uh, time consuming. Thank you. And with the time that we have, it looks like we have time for one last question here. And it's, what are the drawbacks of immunoassays of drug method? Aminoacid, it's the, 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 um, the aminoacids um, depend on it. Um, it's actually the specific, if specificity of aminoacids. If aminoacids are specific, uh, so be able to pick up the drugs you want. The, the drawback is, well, the, um, the cross-reactivity of amino acids. Not all amino acids have the same cross-reactivity profile. Uh, some of them would react with um, structurally related compound, others uh, with the structurally unrelated and causing false positives that require confirmation and then cost, cost the lab more and more, um, you know, and fund. So um, uh, cross reactivity is the issue. The uh, amino acids, especially automated amino acids, are expensive for labs. To um, uh, you have to to really acquire uh, an instrument, which is, uh, uh, those instruments are, are expensive. But uh, and, and 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 if you if you are a la large lab, medium sized lab, even a small lab, which is you could use uh, those automated assays, and there are different sizes of, of instruments you could use um, that that suit your you know capability. All right. Thank you. 
I actually have one last question here that we might have time for. Are two different technology a must for reporting a conformity result? Can you repeat that question again? Let's see. Not a problem. Are two different technology a must for reporting a conformity result? Well, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, different technologies, uh, different technology also have have some uh, their own uh, influence on the result. But the most important thing is really what you're using, what the antibody you're using in in, in your assays. Uh, if the antibodies are specific, um, you will uh, you um, you you'll be getting results. Uh, Reflect, reflected in, in the actual concentration of the drugs in a sample, uh, minimum amount of uh, positive and negative, neg false neg negative, false positive. Um, so the, the differences, the main difference between between assays, although there are differences, the technology influences the performance of assay, its ability to, to uh, the, the uh, efficiency of the, assay, the test, but the antibodies uh, are very important in determining those whether these assays are or they give you um, uh, you know the result that reflects what's in the sample. Thank you. And do you have any final comments today, Doctor? Before we let you go. Hello. Oh yeah. And do you have any final comments today, Doctor? No, just uh, just want to say for for um, a dr drug testing, uh, pain management drug testing. Uh, this I, I would say the um, although the low cutoff uh, assays would be very suitable for for drug testing. Although we have one has to look at the cross reactivity profile of the assay. If the assay very uh, more specific, you could use those low cutoff for pain management testing, and it would be convenient and also uh, useful. And at the end, well, I'd like you very much. thank you and Labrut for, for giving me opportunity to, to present. Well, thank you, Doctor. And I'd also like to thank Labrut as well for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February of 2017. You'll receive an email from Labrut alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We'll invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.